Hello everybody and welcome to today's video, another motherboard coverage, yet this time it isn't Intel. Today we're going to base uh, this video on the X870 motherboard, specifically ASRock X870 Steel Legend Wi-Fi. Now I did cover the other Steel Legend motherboard and today we're going to go with this one. Unfortunately there isn't still uh, some lower versions of the motherboard, so basically I had to use this processor to pair it up with this a bit higher motherboard, let's put it this way. So we're having AMD Ryzen 5 9600X and uh, going to see what it can bring to the table. Regardless of what you already seen, I had to have some processor to test this uh, board out and to see how it performs. I know it's not relevant to those terms when we're talking about high-end processors, but 9800X3D is arriving, so I'm going to have that as well uh, in the near future. So what's it all about this board? First of all, and most important, the Steel Legend boards, as you already know, and as you already seen in a couple of uh, my past reviews, they all look exquisite, I have to admit. And I have to go with the aesthetic design first and then the core details that you need to know eventually. So what we have right here is full white, PCB white as well. Everything is just with a dash of silver. Of course, the RAM slots are black, so you can't go against that. And um, okay, some other connections as well. Let's be honest, we, I didn't see a board that has all white. Maybe you did, so leave a comment, let me know. I'm really curious uh, or might have skipped or forgot. But regardless of everything, we're talking about motherboard that supports AMD Ryzen 9000 series, 8000 series and 7000 series. So this is outstanding. And uh, AM5 socket uh, chipset is X870 as already stated. And the power phase design is 14 plus 2 plus 1 with Dr. Moss for V-Core plus SOC. It has four sticks of D for DDR5, which is obvious. And I don't even want to mention what this board is capable when we're talking about the memories because some sweet spot is 6000. I mostly on AM5 use 6400. And it works solid, I have nothing against. Everything above that is totally useless and I would definitely suggest not going with the higher memories, uh, well, at least clock speed, because it just doesn't make sense. The sweet spot is 6,000, 6,400 is still somewhat acceptable. Then we go with the expansion slot. You have two of those. One is PCIe 5.0 times 16 and the other one is PCIe 4.0 times 16. We have loads of USB ports. So we have two USB 4 type C at the rear, one USB 3.2 generation 2 times 2 type C at the front, two USB 3.2 generation 2 type A at the rear, 7 USB 3.2 generation 1, 3 at the rear, 4 at the front, 8 USB 2.0, 4 rear, 4 front. Outstanding. So much connectivity when we're talking about that. It's just great. And the graphic outputs, we have one HDMI and two USB 4 type C. That's interesting. Talking about storage, now we have four SATA 3, because why not? And then we have one Blazing M.2, which is PCIe Gen 5 times 4 and two Hyper M.2 PCIe Gen 4 times 4 Taking into consideration past boards that are reviewed, they have 4 and upwards M.2 slots. So, yeah, it's, I don't know, if you want to fill up the motherboard with more M.2 SSDs, you just have to figure something out. But this one has 3 slots, so, yeah, there, that's it. For the audio, we have 7.1 channel HD audio Realtek ALC 4082 audio codec with Nahimic audio. LAN is Realtek 2.5G LAN. VLAN is 802.11BE Wi-Fi 7 plus Bluetooth, of course. And the form factor compared to some past, or well, basically the past model was also the Steel Legend, was also ATX. The Tai Chi and Tai Chi Lite were actually E-ATX. This one is ATX. Now, if we go to the I.O. overview, we have, starting from the top, we have HDMI, two antenna ports, we have BIOS flashback. 4 USB 2.0, 2 USB 3.2 generation 2, 2 USB 3.2 generation 1, USB 4 type C, then you have 2.5G LAN, USB 3.2 generation 1 type A, USB 4 type C, microphone out and SPDIF. I would say that it's quite nicely enriched with USB ports. I can't deny that. I mean, some past Steel Legend boards didn't have this much. So that's good. What I actually saw at Gamescom this year, 
was loads of their boards had those quick release for the M.2. Now this board compared to the Intel one has only the main one, the Gen 5 times 4 The bottom one is on two screws and basically it's quite easy to remove it. Uh, they all have thermal pads, you have to remove the foil to get maximum thermal dissipation. So there's that. Now EPS ports on this board are located properly, on, I mean properly regularly as we uh, are used to on the far left side. Then we have on the far right side three PWM ports. So we have for the pump, for the CPU fan and the chassis fan. Going to the right we have 24 pin SATA, then we have USB 3.2. Uh, next to that we have a Type-C connectivity, again another USB 3.2, four SATA 3 ports. At the bottom we have front uh, connectors for the power on button, reset button, uh, LEDs for the hard drive and for the power button. I totally skipped on the far top right corner we have two uh, addressable RGB ports. Then we go with two additional PWM headers, another addressable RGB port. Then we have standard RGB port and HD audio and one PWM header which is kind of awkward to be honest is located right on the left side near the blazing M.2 heatsink. Now this could be quite handy if you have a rear fan which is really short with the cable. So you can just plug that one in but it still could be a bit visible but nothing drastical, right? When we're talking about BIOS for instance, now they, they changed it but I think mostly they changed the color scheme, nothing specifically in those terms. So as you can see when you enter it, it's completely white, white background. I mean, I think they went a bit over the board when we're talking about that, but that's quite all right. The main page in the advanced one actually just gives you some details. So with a BIOS version, processor type, uh, max speed and stuff like that. Then we go with the OC tweaker where you could do CPU uh, overclocking, DRAM frequency adjustment. You can of course go with uh, manual or automatic when you just enable XAP or Expo. Advanced, you have CPU configuration, PCI configuration. Uh, you can see that in advanced what you can do for the CPU basically. Then we go with tools. You have ASR, USB, LED test form, LED firmware recovery, SSD secure erase tool, NVMe sanitation tool and instant flash. Hardware monitor. Now at this point I'm quite shocked. Basically all the boards that I recently reviewed have specific page for fan configuration or fan adjustment or fan speed curve adjustment and this one doesn't. You can't adjust it just with a click of a mouse to drag the, those uh, lines uh, however you wish. You actually have to enter it manually or you can adjust quiet, performance, uh, stable or whatever it is or automatic. Yeah, so that's something that I would really appreciate that this BIOS had and in general all motherboards should have that type of BIOS because it's really easy and user-friendly in those terms. Security, supervisor password, user password uh, and uh, secure boot and at the boot you can choose whatever you want. Uh, we also have an easy mode where you get some information about the motherboard processor, DRAMs, uh, you can enable XMP right here. Storage configuration, fan status without being able to configure anything, CPU temperature, time date, and uh, basically boot priority. That's all there is to it. Nothing extra or nothing more than that. Uh, it's, as I said, I would really like to see that fan configuration or fan fantastic tuning. Well, that is, that exists, but I would really like to have that just adjusting the curve with the click of a mouse. Much easier, user friendly, and definitely appreciate it. Let's go into benchmarks because we have loads of stuff to uh, carry around to check out and yeah. ID64 cache and memory benchmark, uh, we have XPG, Lancer uh, DDR5 uh, RGB, uh, CL30 6400 MHz, read speed 75,849 megabytes per second, write speed 81,783 megabytes per second, copy 58,000. 731 megabytes per second. Latency 74.7. It's not bad, it's just... It, it is what it is with 6400 megahertz. You seen the review yesterday with 8200 megahertz on Intel and what it did, so yeah. I had a 64 AES, 3884 megabytes per second compared to the Intel Core Ultra 9, but I know it's a completely different processor, but this is like 200,000 difference, regardless. Cinebench R, 
23 single thread score 2105 10 minutes cpu test we had clock speed at 4594 14 passes score was 15131 with the average thermals of 58 then we have with Cinebench R23 altogether. It starts at 56, ends at 60. But uh, to be honest, uh, it was good. Uh, it started at uh, 4580 megahertz uh, and ended up at 46. So that's good. It's It was going higher and higher and achieving better performance and better scores because it started at 15,792. It casually build it up and eventually the last ru four runs were at 16,000 eventually going 16,290 outstanding now let's finish up with Cinebench and let's go with Corona 1.3 100 seconds so 1 minute and 40 seconds to finish up the render uh, 4.8 million rays per second and uh, basically this is just a processor you can't actually take this motherboard into consideration when we're doing that configuration but you're basically giving getting a review of the motherboard when we're talking about stability and you're getting a review of the processor in general so corona 10 4.8 million again for a bit more because uh, corona 10 has 4,849,755 while the 1.3 had 4,824,690 indigo benchmark bedroom 1.830 million samples per second while the supercar 4.315 million samples per second ida 64 system stability test quite important right 57 degrees on the cpu uh, clock speed was 4806 megahertz with the gpu running at 71 degrees but that's irrelevant the SSD that I use for benchmarking, Kingston KC 3000 Gen 4 times 4, 4 terabytes, AS SSD, read speed 6642.37 megabytes per second, write speed 5989.25 megabytes per second, auto disk benchmark read 6.88 gigabytes per second, write speed 6.39 gigabytes per second, crystal disk mark read 7201.52 megabytes per second, and write speed 6667.16 megabytes per second. What I would say is that compared to Intel, what I did with uh, KC3000 and the King's Fury Renegade Gen 4 SSD, this one doesn't have literally any problems, so they did that right. 3D Mark CPU profile, max threads, uh, I mean max threads or 16 threads, it's basically the same, but apparently it's not for the CPU profile. Max threads 4949 and 16 threads 5545. Time Spy Extreme, uh, what we got here is 9802, uh, while what I got uh, from the other is basically quite solid. It actually, <laughs> it actually beats uh, um, in pair with uh, RTX 4070 Ti Super, it beats AMD Ryzen 9 7900X3D and AMD Ryzen 9 7900X, which is just wow. CPU score was much lower, 4890, so the CPU score is double down. Uh, regardless, this Time Spy Extreme was in a combination. Then we go with Time Spy, the regular one. CPU score was uh, 9886. You can see the difference that it's by 5000 difference, and Time Spy in general was 20,058. So taking that into consideration it's really strange to see that the rtx 4070 ti super in combination with this processor actually performs quite good then we go with fire strike now 40,874 uh, it's really up there uh, physics score 29,000 that's the only difference you can see that there's 10,000 difference uh, in points and combination 15,656 which definitely beats all three of these processors. Then we go with Fire Strike Extreme. We have 26,662, which just goes neck to neck in that combination with 7900X3D and 7900X. Uh, physics score was 29,328, which you can see it uh, again, 11,000 points less. And then we have combined 14,450. Obviously, I mean, it's strange to have Intel Core Ultra 9285K in combination with RTX 4080 Super having lower scores than 9600X and 4070Ti Super. That's just, that's just funny. So, all in all, what I can say is in combined score and in general, uh, altogether score was really good uh, taking that into consideration. 
Uh, now, the interesting part. Here we go. PCMR10-9366 compared to Intel Core Ultra 9285K, which was uh, 8892. Uh, this is wow. Then we go with uh, Essentials. 11,333, you can see the difference with Intel Core Ultra uh, 9. Then we go with productivity, 12,277 beats Intel Core Ultra 9. Digital content creation, 16,023. You can see the digital content creation for Intel Core Ultra. Then we go with Geekbench uh, 6, where the multi-score uh, was uh, 13,912, while the single thread score was 3,220. You might find this build uh, quite familiar and this was actually the build that I uh, used for benchmarks. Uh, basically 9600X does need more than the 240 radiator, uh, 240 AAO, so it cooled it down properly and the thermals were quite solid. As you saw in Cinebench and all the other benchmarks, around 58 to 60 and this uh, motherboard handled it quite well. Not quite sure how uh, how well will it handle or would it handle 9800X3D, but fortunately I still don't have it. So until it arrives, I wouldn't uh, properly know, right? But until then, what I can say and taking into consideration this configuration. So we're having 9600X, we're having RTX 4070 Ti Super right here. We're having XPG Lancer DDR5. These are on 2x16, 6400 megahertz and uh, KC 3004 terabytes Gen 4 times 4 in this configuration with the ASRock X870 still legend Wi-Fi. Everything that this board did was give the room for the components other to communicate properly and I'm not saying this to say something in a conclusion but to be real about everything this board actually helped to transfer all of that into quite outstanding scores compared to MD Ryzen 9 7900X 3D, 7900X and Intel Core Ultra uh, 9 to 85K. I'm not saying it beats them everywhere, right? I'm saying that it performed quite nicely compared to these three and uh, I know it's totally a necessary comparison, but some certain segments in synthetic benchmarks, uh, it actually did perform quite nicely altogether. So this board, when we we're talking about this one, as you can see first with the aesthetics, it fits perfectly in a full white build. There's no doubt about that. Secondly, the specs, I'm missing that M.2 slot for having those four slots because this is an X870 board. It's not a B something, whatever, right? So in those terms, okay, if they placed on Intel that uh, toolless multi-layer heatsink for easy removal on the other two M.2 slots, why they didn't place it here. And one more thing, and that is the BIOS adjustment for the fan curves and stuff similar to those. That, that, those are the things that I would definitely change and fix that for the next generation or at least just for some other motherboard that is in this category that will be in quite few, some future released. All in all, regarding everything else, it's a solid board, I have to admit. There was no blue screens of that, there was no problems with RAMs, there was no problems in BIOS, there was no problems in transfer speeds or anything similar to that, it just performs quite nicely. And what we experienced in the past gen X boards for the AMD Ryzen AM5 or whatever, uh, we're definitely going a nice way with these ones. This is of course the first board, uh, there's another board arriving when we're talking about the X series, or X870 chipset, so you can expect that review coming uh, quite shortly, I would say in two, three weeks maybe, when the 9800X3D arrives, so I can pair it up quite nicely for you guys, and uh, you can check it out. But until then, you can check out other videos uh, regarding the other motherboard reviews, other PC builds, and you can check this PC build as well, uh, it was a couple of videos back. You can also check uh, some other benchmarks as well. And of course, so you don't miss that 9800X3D build or video or motherboard that I will cover with that processor. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, click the notification bell, guys, and I will see you shortly. Bye.